Good morning. Hopefully, as you picked up in that last set of lecture that I put together, where where we come from here in IO psychology, right? You know, like we said, there was a lot of fight against applying psychology. Psychology was seen as a pure science, a pure discipline. The application of this discipline was going to pollute it. But as I said, um, money, money, money. University said, hey, guys, we need you to produce something. Okay, so what is IO psychology? Well, it's the application. Remember um, Francis Bacon's experiments of light to get the basic principles and experiments of fruit. In other words, apply those principles to solve some problems. And so in the workplace, there's problems, you know, things to do. And as, as I, you now know about my cynicism, the main problem in the work field is make more money, right? So that is the main problem that just has many different ways. So they apply the principles of psychology to understand attitudes and behaviors of employees and employers, interpersonal relations, sounds a little bit like social psychology to understand how the structure of the organization influences the employees and ultimately productivity, right? Um, but motivation, the best way to be a leader, um, matching people to jobs, things of this nature, okay? So it's a pretty broad field, but taking the principles of psychology and applying them to solve the problems that arise in the field of business. IO psychology has two parts, I believe chapters one, two, Two, three, four, f wait, no, I guess it would be three, four, five, six, and seven. Three through seven, I think, are IO psychology topics. <laughs> three through seven are IO psychology, and I think eight on is maybe organizational. Can't remember exactly, but it's something like that. So industrial psychology is all about the individual workers, or more about the individual workers, and organizational psychology is about the, the, the company itself, the organization itself, okay? Um, what we find, yeah, it doesn't say much here, huh? What's that? Um, PSYOP, yeah, PSYOP, the Society for, you know, Industrial Organizational Psychology, the website does have a lot of resources available. In fact, I, uh, many of the readings that we have come off of the PSYOP website. And speaking of, since I, I'm talking in, many, many of our readings came from our website. I, I guess it was called iResearch.com. Net? Mm, good stuff. Very good for uh, sources. So, psych IO psychologists are trained in the scientist practitioner model. And this is the same model that is, is formed the basis of clinical psychology way back when. And that is, in order for you to practice a field, you must first be a scientist and understand that field. Okay? The Bates at premises, this is the way I break down the premise. Um, can you imagine you take your car into the auto mechanic and the mechanic says, sure, I'd love to fix your car, the practitioner approach. But you know what? I don't exactly understand how an internal combustion engine works. Okay, So it's like, that's just silly. If you don't understand how the internal combustion engine works, you ain't got no business trying to fix a car. And it's the same kind of a thing here with IO psychology. If you're not first a scientist, then says this model, you have no business trying to apply what you don't first know. Okay? So IO psychologists are trained to be first and foremost scientists. Um most IO psychologists have a master's or a PhD. Yeah, I worked with a lot of IO psychologists, master's students. Oh, interesting group. Oh, uh, what was this one? Yeah, that's interesting. Things, yeah, yeah read, read some place about that. Okay, here. What do IO psychologists do, or more specifically, where are they employed? Um, professors employed by universities. What's actually kind of interesting is that IO psychologists at universities sometimes end up in the psych department, sometimes end up as in the business school. We're going to find that um, IO psychology heavily, heavily in, uh, interacts with, with business. In fact, um, way back when, when I first started at Texas Wesleyan University, there was a, a degree in uh, business psychology. And it was very well received. But then the uh, business school, the School of Business, wanted to get a particular accreditation from some, I don't know, some accrediting agency. And this business psychology program interfered with your ability to get accreditation. And so, guess which wins, right? 
And so we find, though, that there is a lot of overlap between these two. 20% of them work in private organizations, 4% work in nonprofits, some work for governments, but many, many work for consulting firms, okay, where individual companies hire an individual worker to solve an individual problem. Um, depends on what they're doing. Uh, what kinds of things do IO psychologists do? And again, they, they, they can specialize, right? It can be an IO psychologist that only does selection, okay? And I mean, it's critical. If you don't select the right person for the job, you've wasted, wasted all the time, wasted the energy, you've lost a poten potentially one. And so you, when you do selection for a job, you want to make sure you have done it properly. Training, what's the best way to train? Training is expensive. We'll have full chapters on this stuff, on um, these different uh, subheadings here. We're going to have one quality of work life. I like that. You know, things like um, we're going to talk later on about like uh, work family struggles, right? We're going to talk about stress. We're going to talk about all kinds of different areas in IO psychology. So, really, this, this question, primary areas for IO psychology. All you got to look is the title of the topics in our, in our course here, and you pretty much have the primary work areas for, you know, psychology. I like this one, sample job titles, okay? I can't see it very well, so, <laughs> excuse me. Sample job titles, director of personnel, okay, VP of personnel, manager of human resources. Yeah, you find a lot of overlap in human resources offices with IO psychology. Organizational development specialist, okay. And you can read the rest there, but look, research scientist, okay? In fact, one of my uh, colleagues, colleagues, I guess classmates, back way back when, he um, he ended up getting his degree. His He wasn't even in, he didn't even get a degree in IO psychology. He got a degree in experimental psychology with me. Um, but that means, of course, that he had the basic principles of, of science and experimentation. And he was hired by QVC, the, the home shopping channel, you know, the one that sells crap on. And it was really actually pretty interesting. He said that every day it was something different. It was product placement. You know, when you're, when you're presenting uh, products on television, what's the best way to present the product? And then, of course, it depends on the product and it depends on the audience and stuff. And it was very interesting. And he, he talked about how every single day, wh how, what's the best way to package um, what's the best way to sell it? Should you sell quantities of three at a time and, or, you know, at a discount or, or one at a time and stuff? But, and here's my cynicism again. I told you I was cynical. <clears throat> he says, every day I go into work. It's interesting. It's always different. It's always different. It's always different. But he says, ultimately, hey, don't get me in trouble. This is a quote from somebody else, not me. He says, ultimately, I'm a whore. All I do is make money for the company, Okay. Each day, it's a slightly different way to do so, but ultimately, make me money, okay? Uh, that was, I mean, I, I'm cynical all by myself. That was his cynicism, all right? But interesting. Uh, oh, wow, I kind of just hit the same button twice. Okay, so where does it come from? Um, offices, the way we know them, didn't always exist the way they are. Um, it's kind of a newer... A newer idea, even the whole idea of uh, bringing people together into one central location to perform work. But I'm not really teaching the history of, you know, technology or something. But yeah, it, it, at some point in history, people figured out that it was it was cheaper rather than sending work out to your workers where they live. It was cheaper to bring the workers into a central location, a factory where they could produce. So anyway, it's about the money. But what do we find is that um, pre-World War One, the office, whatever that means, was a real informal place, um, real informal. But what happened was um, later on, and we'll talk more about Charles Taylor, I don't know, chapter 14, I think, or topic 14. I keep forgetting his topics, not chapters. We don't have a book. I got it. So topic 14 or something. Um, we'll talk more about him. But um, Frederick Taylor, really, he, he created the principles of scientific management. So, I mean, he put the word science right in it, in which he basically proposed that you should take and scientifically analyze all jobs and break them down 
and find the most efficient way to do everything. And we'll talk about an example later. But one of my favorite examples with uh, Frederick Taylor was um, what he did was he was analyzed the job of a coal shoveler. All right, it was crazy, right? Because you had to shovel the coal into to fire it and etc. And what he did was he broke down the task and he looked at different shapes of shovel, different volumes of shovel, all of these different things. And he found that very cool. And again, I think it's in topic 14. Um, a very cool curve is like as you increase the amount of coal on the shovel, you get more and more productive work until you cross a certain threshold. And once you cross a threshold of pounds per shovel, then all of a sudden productivity drops off. And so Frederick Taylor was able to take the job of coal shoveler, whatever, and like triple the productivity of, of this occupation. And he did so by breaking down the task into tiny steps and, and scientifically analyzing each and every step. Because, of course, his coal shoveling also involved teaching the workers, you know, the best way to bend, right? The most efficient way to bend your knees, etc., and lift. And as, it was just quite a spectacular thing he did. Um, Carnegie Institute of Technology in 1915. Hey, I did Carnegie Mellon University. Same place. That was before the Mellon Institute joined them. But anyway, um, the Carnegie Institute was one of the earliest places. What we find is that... Um, in the early days, I.O. psychology, just like uh, just like business was, was um, not an academic discipline. I mean, business and I.O. psychology fell in the realms of a professional degree or something. I mean, they didn't, they weren't traditionally trained in the liberal arts background. Like, you know, you guys have to take the general education courses and you know, appreciating theater and da 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 da. -da. Well, the whole the whole I.O. psychology and business schools did not have that model for many, many, many years. They were literally career preparation schools. That was what they were. So quite an interesting change since then. We find Hugo Munsterberg was a fascinating character in the history of psychology, not just the history of I.O., but the history of psychology. Hugo Munsterberg is uh, German, as you can imagine from that name, right? And uh, what happened was, uh, very briefly, because I, I, I love history, um, uh, William James was the chair of the department at Harvard. He was the most powerful psychologist in the world there at, at Harvard. And William James wanted to study the occult. He wanted to study um, seances and stuff like this. And the university told him, look, here's your deal. You can either stay in this position and not study the occult or study the occult and leave. Well, he's I'm gone. So he had met Hugo Munsterberg when he was in traveling in Europe at one point. So he invites Munsterberg in to, to fill his position, but Munsterberg doesn't even speak English. <laughs> it's like, okay. So Hugo Munsterberg came in, and he was powerful because Hugo Munsterberg, he proposed, the he really was the father of applied psychology across the board. He is considered to be the father of uh, 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 legal side. Uh, what would you call it? forensic psychology, the father of I.O. psychology, the father of uh, clinical psychology. So all of these different applied areas of psychology, we can thank Hugo Munsterberg for really getting the ball rolling. And Hugo Munsterberg put, said one thing that I, that sticks with me really to this day. I mean, I'm, I cannot disguise my cynicism about I.O. as a whole, but he said something so important. He said, there's no such thing as a bad job. There's bad placement of people into jobs. And I was like, no, what? No, that makes sense. In that way, I can dig it. I.O. psychology is a helping discipline. They are helping make the world a better place. They're supporting Francis Bacon's mission about the goal of science. Okay, cool. So I like it. A bad placement of people into jobs, not a bad job. Ah, cool. Thank you, Hugo. That was a good one. Well, what happened was coming through World War I, the army came a-calling, and they needed to, to recruit many, many, many applicants, and they brought in Robert Yerkes. Robert Yerkes was, was asked, what I, we would like you to do is to create um, some kind of a test that we can use to determine who, sh who would be good soldiers, who's good and who's not good. Well, when Robert Yerkes started doing this, he created the first... Um, 
paper and pencil intelligence tests. Now, intelligence tests had existed before Robert Yerkes comes along, but they were all, you know, one tester, one person, take four hours, it's an intense process. This is like wing bing done, right? Here's some paper, here's a pencil, go, okay? So he's the first one to do this. And when he started to do this, what he found was like half of the army recruits were illiterate. What the heck? So he had to create two versions of the test the Army Alpha and the Army Beta. And the Army Alpha was for um, soldiers that could read, and the Army Beta was for soldiers that could not read. And it was it was it had limited usefulness. It gave it gave IO psychology a, a lot of spotlight, but ultimately um, when Robert Yerkes, because Robert Yerkes basically had proposed somewhere around 25% of the recruits that came in, Robert Yerk said that they just don't have the intelligence necessary to be a soldier, right? And of course the army said, um, yeah, I think we're going to take these guys as soldiers. So it, it brought IO psychology into the spotlight, but it was not, <laughs> it was not as useful as you might think because the army has different priorities than Robert Yerkes does, right? Uh, James Cattell. James Cattell is a fascinating guy. He, he did some cool stuff in some other areas too, but in, in this relation to this one, he started the Psychological Corporation is what he called it. And so their goal, I mean, the goal of the Psychological Corporation is, you know, the original consultants, right? We had just said IO psychologists are consultants, but the original consultants. And so what they would do is, um, what, what did they do? Maintain quality reputation in the field by certain blah, 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 help. You can read that stuff. But the psychological corporation today has completely shifted, and the psychological corporation today has a new name that some of you may be familiar with, and that's ETS or Educational Testing Services. And ETS is the the bad boy behind tests such as the SAT. Okay, so clearly this IO psychology had its roots in in some pretty big pretty big current phenomena. Well, one of the biggest things that came out of IO psychology, biggest studies ever, was what they called the Hawthorne studies. And this, this was at the Hawthorne Electrical Plant somewhere in Illinois, somewhere in, outside of Chicago. And at this, this electrical plant, and I mean, I'll leave it on you to read all of the details, but I'll, I'll give you the summarization on what it was all about. They went in and did various manipulations to see what they could do to increase productivity. And what they were finding was just crazy results. They would make these predictions, they get these results, blah, 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 blah. They couldn't figure it out. Well, here's the reason is that, and this is a basic premise now in all experimental work, is that when people are being watched, they do what they're capable of, not what they actually do. So when the IO psychologists went into the Hawthorne Electrical Plant, the workers know, knew they were being watched. And so all of a sudden, every single time that they were being watched, productivity would increase, right? And then when you're not being watched, productivity decreases. And so the fundamental point behind the Hawthorne effect was this increase in attention was enough to change worker behavior. Okay? Very interesting. Uh, the war, yeah, in World War II, they started to incorporate, just like Yerkes in World War I with the um, IQ testing, but instead what they did was the Army General Classification Test, which is uh, much like the modern ASVAB, if anybody's heard of it. But it's uh, it was designed not just to determine who would make good soldiers or not, but which occupations that people would be best suited for. Okay, So kind of like a job placement in the military. So it was kind of a cool idea. Okay. So what's been hot more recently? Um, fairness of selection tests. Yeah, you know what? It's like um, fairness. <laughs> In fact, tie that into come down towards the bottom legal issues. There's been some a whole lot of legal questions. Hey, I was more qualified and they got hired. How come? You know. So fairness is is a word for you to work with, right? Um, but clearly, cognitive revolution. That is to say. A worker on a assembly line is not a machine. Okay, they have needs more than just oil and maintenance, right? I mean, you have to consider the individual itself. 
clearly there's a lot of internet applications to IO psychology say for example what's the best or, or most effective or cost effective way to train employees should I have people come to my central location should I send a trainer to your factory should I create instructional videos should I and so we'll talk more about that in the training chapter but clearly work family issues and again that's related to that cognitive revolution idea is that your workers are not machines that you just shut off at night they exist outside and there's more and more of an understanding that if you can address the family issues then the work side goes up okay and we'll, we'll talk about some of these I mean all of these as we move along hey my little slides moved okay um yes IO psychology moving forward yeah uh let's see <laughs> global competition yeah we need to make sure downsizing okay laying off competition i like this image on the top right it's a silly com uh, comic but it's true this is what happens when you downsize is more you know more and more work workers are being dumped with more and more jobs more and more hats to wear more and more things that they are required to figure out how to do what is this one? Yeah, well, we'll talk more about the flatter. This is uh, this is actually questions from again topic fourteen all the way towards the end. That um, the, what's the most efficient way to create your organizational structure? Should you have a president or CEO rather, CEO, vice president, you know, manager or what? I mean, so. All of these middle positions, managers, associate VPs, VPs, they all command a higher salary than a regular worker. Do they justify it? Because ultimately, managers don't produce anything, okay? They manage the producers. So these managers, which command a higher uh, salary, aren't actually producing, right? And so a flatter organizational structure has been a, a more popular approach to eliminate some of those managerial type positions that aren't actually increasing the bottom line. Um, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. All right. So we'll come back um, in topic two. And I believe topic two is job analysis, which is actually a pretty cool topic. Okay. We're going to lay out what the heck a job is in the next topic, okay? So I will see you next time.